everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about Canadian research. Now, Ancestry.com, as you may know, is the name of our company, but it's also the name of our U.S.-based research site. And so the videos that I do um, are, t are typically geared towards our U.S. audience. Um, if you're interested in resources for our Canadian um, market or for our U.K. Um, subscribers, you can go to those websites, Ancestry.ca, Ancestry.co.uk. We have websites in Australia and Italy and Sweden and Germany. Um, you can go to any one of those local sites and receive help on how to do research in that location. So today we're going to be talking about Canadian research, but we're going to be talking about it specifically from the perspective of somebody who is researching from the U.S., into Canada, particularly um, a specific ancestor who may have um, migrated down into the United States. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be some helpful information for those of you who are Canadian researchers whose family has always been in Canada. Um, you may still live in Canada. You're um, by all means welcome to join us, but um, that, that's just, the, just a little heads up on the perspective we're going to take today. Now, um, with that said, we're going to um, just cover some of the basics. This is not going to be an in-depth course on Canadian family history research. However, at the end of the presentation, I will provide you with some specific resources available to you so that you can go do some more research into how to research uh, Canadian records if you need more in-depth information. Now, with that said, let's go ahead and dive into the presentation. Let me just give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. We're just going to do some basic getting started stuff, and then I I will spend some time on specifically what Canadian records are available on Ancestry.com and then I'll just highlight a couple of my favorite tools for doing Canadian research. I have um, a branch of my family who actually um, was here in the United States and migrated or immigrated up to Canada um, in the late 1890s and have family that's still there. So um, we'll talk about some of the tools available that I use to do research into that particular family. So let's talk specifically about getting started. Um, one of the things, and this is true whether you're doing research, Canadian research or U.S. research, it doesn't matter, family history research in general, one of the things that I'd like you to start um, becoming familiar with is this idea of formulating a specific research question. I get emails every single day from people um, who struggle with this a little bit, and so it's just a skill I'd like you to start practicing so that you can get better at it. One of the things I have discovered is that as I formulate specific research questions, if I can do that right up front, uh, and if I can make it an effective question, then my research goes a lot more, a lot easier. I'm more focused, um, and answers are quicker to come than maybe if I hadn't, if I skipped that step. So I'm actually going to use one of your questions today. This is a question I received just a couple of weeks ago, um, and she didn't have this question outlined as such, but from the email, this is what I think she's looking for. She wants to know who the parents uh, are for Edward James Hines. Okay, that's a very specific research question that, that should then lead you um, along the path. Now, once you've done that, the next step is to ask yourself what you already know and how you know it. So I extracted from her email some basic information. Um, according to the 1880 census, um, Edward James was living in the United States, but it says that he was born in Canada in about 1832. Now, Canada is a really big country, um, covers a lot of space, and just saying somebody is from Canada is not always the most effective um, way to tackle your research. That would be like saying somebody's from the United States or somebody's from Germany. That's great information, but you need to be a little bit more specific if you're going to be successful. And so um, there is some further information here that might provide us with a closer answer. Um, in this case, the son's marriage license says that he was born in Montreal. Now, Montreal is a big city. Uh, it's also geographically the name of several other places. But if we just go for the, the sake of this, if we assume that it means Montreal, Quebec, that could just be the name of the nearest big city. You know, I'm from Montreal is different than I was born in Montreal or I was born in a small city that's a suburb of Montreal. So it's a, it's a clue, and it gets us closer, hopefully, to a geographic location, but you need to collect more information. 
Um, in this case, this gentleman is uh, died and is buried in Chemung County, New York. So one of the things that I might do then is go look at a map and see how close Chemung County is to the Canadian border. A lot of times, and, and you're going to find this if you do U.S. Canadian cross research, um, people who live near the Canadian border, a lot of times there was travel back and forth. Part of the family lived in one place, part of the family lived in another. Borders are just imaginary lines on maps, really. And so uh, start to th start to think about the fact that um, if they lived in some of those northern states in the United States, check and see where they're living and if it's close to the border. Um, and then see if there's some other communities just on the other side of that Canadian border that might be of interest to your family or that might some of the family might still be there. So this just is how I get started in any research project. I define the question and then I make a list of what I already know and how I know it. And you'll notice um, I haven't put full sources here, but there's a census involved, there's a marriage license involved, there's some um, death and burial information involved. So it's I'm not just copying this information from a book or from somebody else. We're looking for original records that will give us um, documentation or proof of what it is that we know. Now, um, I've talked a little bit about maps, and I'm a big fan of maps, uh, especially when it's a new area to me. I, I want to know the geography. I want to I want to have a vision or a picture in my head of what it is that I'm looking for. Now, if I look at this map, and I don't know if you can see it, you'll want to make your screen full screen so you have a little bit clearer vision here. But Quebec is right here. And then if you come down this Canadian border, um, this is going to be the state of New York in this area. Okay, so Quebec is way up there. Um, Quebec City and Quebec Province and Montreal. You know, so you just kind of want to start to get a feeling for where things are. Is it on a waterway? Is there some kind of a major highway there? Um, lots of just different borders, right? If if you've got somebody living in New York, but there's a family story that they're from British Columbia, you might want to question that a little bit more. Um, yes, people migrate great distances, but typically people migrate. Um, east to west. Very few people migrate west to east. Not that it doesn't happen, but again, we're just getting familiar with the geography of the place. And if you're not terribly familiar with Canadian geography, just a quick look at a map will help that. Now, you can get more specific with your geography. There's actually a database put together by the Canadian government that I love. Um, it's called the Canadian Geographical Names Database. And the URL for that is there on your screen. Let me just read it for those of you who are listening. It's N as in Nancy, R as in Railroad, CAN, C-A-N, dot G-C dot C-A. N-R-CAN.G-C dot C-A. And then if you want to go directly to the place on the website, it's slash earth dash sciences dash home. So NRCAN gc.ca slash earth dash sciences slash home. And when you get there, what you're going to want to do is click on geography and boundaries and then geographical names and then query by name. Let me show you this website so that you know what I'm talking about and so that you know some of the cool things that it can do. I'm going to come over here to my web browser. Here's the, here's the website, Natural Resources Canada, nrcan.gc.ca. Um, over here on the left-hand side, you're going to see Geography and Boundaries. I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to click on Geographical Names. And then in the center there, I'm going to click on Query by Name. So if you have the name of a specific location in Canada that your family came from, maybe that's something you want to look up so that you can become a little bit more familiar with it. Um, oftentimes we'll see a name in a, naturaliz in a naturalization paperwork or on a death record, in a child's marriage record like the one we've seen. And so this just gives you an idea of um, where those places are. Also, one of the things it does is it helps us um, it helps with the disambiguation of the places, right? If you've got several places with the same name, don't just assume they're from the place that is the most well-known or the most popular. So let me just make this screen a little bit bigger. You can see here I've searched for Montreal. There are 31 places in Canada with the name Montreal. Okay, so just because your family may have a story that they're from Montreal, don't assume that means Montreal Quebec. Okay, there are there's a Montreal Bay and a Montreal Creek and a Montreal Falls. Um, 
Montreal Falls is an unincorporated area, which is um, not, it hasn't been made into a town, incorporated town, but it is still a place, not just a geographic feature. Uh, Montreal Island uh, is a location. There's Montreal Lake, um, which is also an unincorporated area. There's Montreal Lake, which is an Indian reserve. So I, I use this just as an example to prove a point, which is just because somebody says they're from a place, and this is true in any genealogy research, um, look into the name of that place and see if maybe there are other places with that same name. Particularly when they're popular places, um, we say, oh, well, my family was from Montreal. And maybe that story has been passed down, but maybe it doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. Um, it could, it very well could, but um, that just gives you an idea. And I love this resource for looking into those um, Canadian geographical names. Since I'm not as familiar with, with Canadian geography, it helps me become a little bit more familiar with where those places are. So that, again, is the Canadian Geographical Names Database. And if you've got a location in Canada, maybe spend some time becoming a little more familiar with the area. Um, you can click on any one of those um, locations. It'll take you to a map, and then you can see what else is around there. That also becomes important when you start um, collecting records. So let's talk about records. Um, I've said this before. I'll say it again. Uh, we're also eager to cross the pond or cross the border in this case. We want to see where our family's from. As a matter of fact, in the in the example that I used in this instance, um, she actually wants to know who James's parents are because they came from Ireland, um, supposedly, and she wants to know where in Ireland they're from. And of course, they migrated from Ireland into Canada, um, had at least one child in Canada, and then either he or he with his parents, came down into the United States. Well, just in what I've shared there, there are some holes. And so one of the things you need to do is to collect all possible records in the United States before moving on to Canadian records. That's going to ensure that you have the right location and that you have the right person. So, you know, it would be a tragedy for her to just jump on the first Edward James Haynes she found in Montreal, born about 1832, uh, only to later discover, maybe after years of research, that it was the wrong one. So, of course, we're going to do some more census work. She had listed in her email that she'd found him in the 1880 census, um, but she didn't list any other census records. Um, was he still alive in 1900? Uh, was he in the 1870, 1860, 1850 census? If he's alive in the 1900 census, does he list his naturalization status? 1900 through 1920 censuses here in the United States list a year of immigration and a naturalization status. That naturalization status could lead you to naturalization paperwork, um, de uh, declarations of intent, and petitions for naturalization that very often list a specific birthplace as well as information about entry into the United States, the date, the ship, the you know method, mode of transportation. In the case of Canada, sometimes it's just a simple border crossing by car, sometimes it's on a railroad, sometimes it is by ship. And so that brings me to border crossings. Um, we have a, a collection, and I'll show this to you in just a minute, a large collection of Canadian border crossings, both from the U.S. into Canada and from Canada into the United States. If all you have is a United States subscription to Ancestry.com, you still have access to those border crossings. Um, if all you have is a Canadian subscription to Ancestry.com, you still have access to those border crossings because they touch both countries. And then, of course, if you have a world subscription to Ancestry.com, you have full access to everything we have anywhere. So um, so be, spend some time in some of these U.S.-based records and make sure you have a complete story. You've filled in all the gaps so that when you get back to the records in Canada, then you'll know that you have the right person. Now, the next step in this process, especially if you're not familiar with Canadian records, is to become familiar with the kinds of records that are available to help you answer your question. Canada has a census. Um, the earliest census available on Ancestry.com, I believe, is 1851. 
Canada uh, has a 92-year privacy law on their census. So here in the United States, it's only 72 years. In uh, England, it's 100 years. Uh, somehow, Canada kind of split the difference and leaned a little bit more towards England. So they have a 92-year privacy law. What that means, and this is exciting news, is that the 1921 census was just released from um, from the Statistics Division to the Library Archives of Canada uh, on June 1st. So just a couple of weeks ago, um, the Library and Archives Canada took possession of the 1921 census, and it will soon become available um, once they have that digitized. And so that's exciting news if your family um, is in Canada in 1921. But censuses, just like in the United States, become kind of a foundational record set that lets you help to start to build some of those family relationships that you can then use further information to document. So there are also passenger lists. So not just border crossings from the U.S. into Canada and Canada into the U.S., but also passenger lists into Canada. Um, from England and from Germany and Ireland and um, France and there, there's there's a large collection of passenger lists available there and then we also um, there's also a large collection of vital records available and many of those are available on Ancestry.com as well so um, let's look then at what records are available on Ancestry.com for Canadian research. If you're not familiar with the card catalog, that is going to quickly become one of your best friends. Uh, I spend a lot of time in the card catalog just becoming familiar with what's available. So I'm going to hover over search and I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom to card catalog and click on that. When I'm in the card catalog, I have some filter options. So I can come in here, if I know what I'm looking for, I can just type in 1851, it'll bring up um, you know, the 1851 Canadian census. Okay. If I don't know what I'm looking for, if I just want to explore what's available, these are my options for filters. I can filter by record type or collection. You see here we have all of the different types of records. I can filter by location or I can filter by time period. So I'm just going to start right off the bat. Ancestry.com has 31,313 databases as of today. I'm going to click on Canada, and you're going to notice that that number drops significantly um, down to just under 2,000 databases. I can filter further if I want to go to a specific um, province or territory. I can filter down to a, a more specific list. Or if I just want to see, for example, what birth, marriage, and death records Ancestry.com has available for Canada, you'll see I filter down to now 75 databases. Now, that may seem like a small number compared to 31,000, but if you look over here on the, the right-hand side, you're going to see that some of these databases have a lot of records. For example, the Duren Collection, which is a collection of birth, marriage, and uh, uh, well, it's actually christening marriage and burial records uh, because they're church records mostly, um, starts in 1621, goes through 1967, and there are 14 and a half million records in that one database. Um, we've got marriages for Ontario from 1801 to 1928, 3.3 million records. So these databases are very, very large databases with a, with a pretty extensive collection of records. So it's just the card catalog is just a way to become familiar with the kind of records that are available. You can the the card catalog default sort is by popularity. So we show you the stuff at the top of the list that most people search. You can sort that by database title. So it puts it in alphabetical order. Um, one of the things that I do sometimes is I'll come in here and I'll sort it by date added. Then the new stuff shows up at the top so I can see if anything new has been added. I use that feature quite a bit as well. Now, um, let's just take a look at a census record just so that you're a little bit familiar with how this works. So we have the censuses online. Let me sort these by alphabetical order. So the most recent one is on top. You're going to see here the 1851 census, and it's specific to Canada East, Canada West, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Well, that's because in 1851, the boundaries um, of the provinces and territories in Canada were different than they are now. And so you might need to not just do a search here, but pull up a map of the boundaries of Canada in 1851 so that you know where it is that your ancestor was living. They take a census every 10 years, just like we do here in the United States. So you're going to see 
1881, 1881, 1881, 1881, 1881, 1881, 1881, 1881, 1881, years from the U.S. federal census. Here we have a 1906 and a 1916 census for a few um, of the provinces in Canada, in this case Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. There's also the 1911 um, census, which is the most currently available census online. So um, that just gives you an idea of the census records that are available. When I search those censuses, um, you're going to see a little notation here, and you're going to see this on a lot of Canadian records. Just be aware of it. Um, there is a little note here that just says most of these records on, are in English, <laughs> but some of them are also in French, um, and it suggests that you start searching English spellings first. Now, um, many of you know that large portions of Canada, um, French is, is the first language for many of them. Um, they are bilingual in many areas of France. Ancestry.com does not translate records. We transcribe them, which means we copy what's exactly on the record in order for you to be able to search it and find what you need. So one of the another one of the tools that I use a lot is translate google.com where I'll just copy basic lists of information into let me just pull that up actually where I just copy basic um, lists of information into Google Translate so I'll say I want to go from English to French and I want to see the word for born and the word for died and the word for married the word for husband and wife and daughter and son child parent I'll just make a list of um, of basic words that often come up in genealogical records and you'll see as I type those into the English side the words in French come up over here on the right hand side and so then I can just copy that list of words and sometimes I'll just print it out and then tack it on my computer screen as I'm as I'm looking at records so that I can start to recognize some of just the basic words that may come up in records and then if I come across a word I don't understand I'll just come back in here and type that word in as well so um, you start to see some of um, the, you can still use the records even if you don't speak the language. That's the point. <laughs> okay. So just beware that some of the records are in French. Uh, not so much in the census, but um, especially when you start getting into some of those vital records. Now, there is another way to explore what Canadian records are available on Ancestry.com, and it's what we call our place pages. You're going to get there by clicking on search and then scrolling down to the map at the bottom of the page. So let me show you where that's at. If I come here and I click on search, and then I'm going to scroll down the page past the search box to the map. And then you'll see here, because I'm on Ancestry.com, which is the U.S. site, it's defaulting to the U.S., but there is a tab here for Canada. And so I can click on Canada, and then I can click on any one of the provinces uh, in order to bring up a place page for that location. So here you can see I'm looking at the Ontario place page. Here is um, the opportunity. I can view a map of Ontario. I can look and see what records are specific to Ontario. So these aren't nationwide collections like the census or um, a large collection of vital records that cover the whole country. These are um, databases that are specific to this location. So in this case, Canadian voter lists, lists from Ontario from 1867 to 1900. Um, Can uh, Ontario Canadian marriages like it's specific to that location so that's how I use those place pages again just to become a little more familiar with the kinds of records that are available now one of the questions that I get asked a lot is well am I not just going to find everything if I search anyway you will uh, however I am not thrilled with going through dozens of pages of search results this way, I can say, oh, look, here is a database called the Rebellion of 1837 in Upper Canada. What can I scroll down and read? What can I learn about this particular um, database? In this case, it's ships transporting convicted rebels from the Rebellion of 1837 to Van Diemen's Land in Australia, um, and names of those charged in the Short Hills Insurrection of 1838. Right? This is a really small database. However, it might have additional information about 
a specific name that I am searching and I can then do a search that way. So database specific searching uh, will help you. It also helps you become more familiar with the kinds of records that are available. Records you might not have even considered like some of these early Ontario settlers or the building of Perry's fleet on Lake Erie, which was a military action or a military responsibility. So spend some time in the card catalog, spend some time on the place pages just to become familiar with what records are available. Now, uh, the final tip I have for you today has to do with specific tools available on Ancestry.com, and this is really important, especially if you're used to searching in the United States. When you are searching, make sure you're using the advanced search form, and at the bottom of that search form, just above the search button, there is a field called collection priority. And then there's a little checkbox that says, show only records from these collections. Here's where you're going to find that. If I'm on my search page, make sure that you are using the advanced search form. If your search form looks like this, you wanna make sure you check this show advanced box. And it changes the way your search form looks. What it does is it actually gives you full control over the search parameters for every single field. But down here, just above the search button, there is this box called Collection Priority. I can select a specific location and only show records from that location. So you know how sometimes you're doing a search and you're searching for somebody who was born in Virginia and died in Maryland and you get records from England? Well, it's if you set it to United States and click Show Only Records from These Collections, you'll only see US records. You can do that same thing for Canada. So I can say, I only want to see Canadian records in my search results. Um, that's particularly helpful for immigrant ancestors. So you can search for them. It will show you records that, uh, if you just do a general search for them without this set, it will show you records in the US and records in Canada because you'll have both information, both sets of information in your search results or in your search parameters, right? Born in Canada, living in New York. But if I only wanna see the records from the time they were in Canada, I can just set that collection priority, say show only these records, and that's all that I will see in my search results. Hope that made some sense. Um, there is um, actually a bonus tip here at the end. Uh, we do have websites in other countries, like I mentioned at the beginning of um, the presentation and the website for our Canadian research is ancestry.ca. You do have full, if you have a world subscription to ancestry.com, you have access to all the records that are available on ancestry.ca as well. Same records, um, just kind of a different overlay on the records. The, the reason you might want to visit their website is because the learning center there is more geared towards Canadian records and research. You can click on help and get some more specific information there. Um, it just, it's more geared towards Canadian research. So if you wanna learn more specifically about Canadian records, or uh, if you want to sign up to receive the ancestry.ca newsletter, you can do that here as well. All you have to do is just log in with your ancestry.com login and it will and just go to ancestry.ca and then you can in the learning center sign up for that newsletter. That's true for those of you who are in Canada. We get emails all the time saying, why do you keep sending me information about the US? Well, it's probably because at some point you were on ancestry.com and signed up for the newsletter and that's US based. So if you want the Canadian newsletter, go to ancestry.ca to sign up for the Canadian newsletter. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, there is a book that was published years ago by Ancestry.com. It's called Finding Your Canadian Ancestors. It's by Sherry Irvine and Dave Obie. You can order that, I believe, uh, on Amazon.com. And uh, that, if you want more detailed information about how to do Canadian research, that's a really excellent guide for doing that. That is all we have time for today. As a matter of fact, we ran just a little bit over, but hopefully that was useful information. There are a lot of records available in Canada, and I've had some great success using some of those tips to trace some of my ancestors' children and grandchildren who migrated up into Canada and connecting even with some of them, uh, some of their descendants today. Uh, 
If you have any questions about the things we've talked about today, if you're watching this live, I will be on chat in just a few minutes to answer those questions. If you're watching an archived version of this on our YouTube channel, feel free to leave a comment. I do monitor those and will respond as necessary. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.